Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining today's panel discussion for the virtual exhibit themed Inside the Lines, Voices of the Civil Rights Movement, uh, artwork presented by Charles Bibbs, the godfather of contemporary black art. Uh, I'd like to introduce today's panel. Uh, we have educator and activist Jelani Bakari, uh, the artist himself, Charles Bibbs. We have Rochelle Marlboro, who is a wholesale relationship associate with Wells Fargo Commercial Banking. And Dr. Mark Robinson, Robinson, assistant professor from California State University of California, I'm sorry, assistant professor of history at California State University of San Bernardino. Uh, again, thank you guys for uh, joining us and thank you panelists. Uh, before we get started, we'd like to have Charles Bibbs give a brief uh, process and description of his work, uh, the virtual panel, I mean, uh, the virtual uh, exhibit. Charles? Charles, you're on mute. mute. How, how's that? That's better. Okay. Well, let me let me explain to you who I am. Um, I'm an I'm a visual African American artist that's been around for 72 years now, and um, I started out from a from a family of out of Mississippi. Okay, my father and mother came out of Mississippi, and they found a new life in Southern California. Little did I know that uh, a lot of the constraints in terms of civil rights was actively working on our family at that time. And, but my father and my mother were stern type of people that really believed in discipline. And, I remember asking my father, and because I was inspired by looking over his shoulder because he had this talent of doodling while he's paying bills. And I was inspired by that because he was do these little faces. And I think that at that moment, that's when I decided I wanted to be an artist. But little did I know that he had a different ideal about that because when I when I got the courage enough to, to approach him, tell him that I wanted to be an artist, he flat out told me, there's no son of his was gonna be an artist. But way, the way he put it, there's no son of mine is gonna be a starving artist, okay? And I said, I said Dad, what's, what's that all about? He says, son, if you go out and find me a successful black artist, I'll support you. But otherwise, you better change your mind and do something else. So I did that. I went out and found people like Charles White, Bearden, and the list goes on. And I brought this list back to my dad and he says, son, I said successful artists. Now these artists are very popular and renowned now. But 50 years ago, they were struggling, okay? Um, and at that point, I, I was, I was lost. So I made up my mind that if I was going to do anything in art, it would be a hobby and I better concentrate on something that's going to support me and my family. Okay. And so I just went into business, but I never lost the spark to be an artist. Okay but I knew I had something to prove. And I, and I thank God today that my dad challenged me by saying no son of his was going to be a starving artist. So I knew that I had to do this art thing without starving. <laughs> so that was, that was what I started to do, but it took me, it took me almost 35 years 
to accomplish that. And I did it, not by doing what you traditionally is done educationally for artists, because I knew in my mind that I had to be successful. And success in our society is based on how much money you make, okay? So I had to figure out the best way to represent myself and represent my people because I knew at that time that success is going to be relegated to the actions of my people, how they support me. But I had to do it in a moral based business way. So I was one of those artists that was going to use all the techniques in business over my proudness as of an artist. Okay. And I figured that that was the, that was the catalyst. That was the way that I can prove to my father that I could be successful. And in all in all terms, over the last 30 or 40 years, that's exactly what's happened. Okay. And I studied business. I applied my business acumen to my art. Okay. And uh, because of that, I was able to so service more of my constituents. Let's take in, for instance, this piece, Marching in the Spirit, okay? It would have been enough to use this image or that whole subject and just paint a glorious picture of some civil rights marchers. But I had to make sure that the art itself was a catalyst for education. So if anybody put something like this in their home and they got children in the home, I understood that the subconscious effect of imagery is very powerful. Uh, I've had situations where people call me back and says, I just had a dialogue with my, my um, 10 year old about your image. And the, the, the conversation went, went, the way the conversation led, led off is as daddy, what does this mean? And he says, Charles, I was able to get into a dialogue with my child systematically through the art and show them the history of the civil rights movement. Okay, so this one here is called Marching in the Spirits. What, but what people leave out of this image, which I'm gonna bring, bring out right now, the words marching in the spirit. Now the spirits are the spirit of the nonviolent movement, Martin Luther King. Okay, you see the shadow figures in the, behind the colored figures? Those represent the spirits of the nonviolent movement of demonstrating. And when, when, you, when you were taught the ways to demonstrate, you were always reminded no violence. Okay, passive resistance. Okay, the way Martin Luther King put it. The picket signs are events in the civil rights movement that inspires us to work and continue to bring attention to the attention of the American public. We're here and we're fighting for equality. And why we're doing this is because of these images. Emmett Till, okay, Marshall in 1954, the sittings in 1957, the sittings in 1960, Martin Luther King's I Got a Dream speech, okay? And, and, and it goes on and on and on. You see this figure on the, on, the, on the end, the man, it has 1863 on his shirt, and then he has slave chains on his arm, okay? All those are significance in the story. Then in the, po in the, in the purse, my favorite organization is ASALA, the Association of African American Life and History. And their edict is to document those stories for the African American culture. And they and, and because of this image and the and the several other images that are in this show, which was done in commission by ASALA, okay. And because, because I did that, I, I received a lifetime, lifetime artist in residence. And that, that is the ultimate, for me, 
as far as support for my people is the ultimate rec recognition for the work that I put in for the for for Asala. So I continue to work for them. I continue to do images for them that for their fundraising efforts and and what have you. Okay, so if you have any questions on that particular concept, I think this rolls it. This is a good start for our conversation because it has it all in one little picture, and it's uh, it's been very successful. I think we're almost just about sold out of this image. We did limited editions, which allowed a lot of people to own this. And that was one of the things that was necessary for, for me as an artist to be successful was to make the artwork affordable and not just uh, put the artwork out for the, for the affluent and the rich and the famous, okay? It was important for me to make sure that anybody in my community the african-american community can afford to have these imageries in their homes that's a start. thank you for that Charles. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much for that charles uh let's give each panelist a chance to uh comment and uh on the um exhibit uh we can start with you rochelle well, um, I will say the, the exhibit that really spoke volumes to me is the, uh, or the, the image is the shoulder to shoulder. Um, that one actually, because it, it speaks for today, it, you know, all of it has its own message, but that one spoke volumes to me because it talks about we continue to fight equality now, the signs of jobs now, you know, we protest injustice, you know, it's, it's still um, a viable conversation and, um, and it still speaks volumes today you know, the messages of what we're still fighting for. And, you know, when I see this image and everyone's holding on to each other, you know, it makes you stop and think about like the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, everyone is coming together and still trying to voice themselves about the injustice that's happening, you know, and it's still, we're still talking about, you know, equity, you know, equality. We're still talking about, you know, wanting to be a part of, you know, a society where we get equal pay you know we're still protesting for our equal you know justice so that one speaks volumes to me the shoulder to shoulder that's the one that i really um found find very profound for myself and it speaks volumes for today okay thank you thank you uh jelani let's have your uh input thank you um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Yeah, my favorite um, also was the shoulder to shoulder because it shows that in spite of the struggle, we still stay together. We still stay strong. We still uplift one another. Even in our trials and tribulations and the things that we go through, we have to understand that as a united group of individuals, we go through the struggle together. And it was good to see that we we keep that and you see that in almost all of Bibb's art, he tries to keep that hand there. And I see that hand as camaraderie, that we always have our hand there for our brother and sister, the children, mm -hmm. the sons, not just for us, but for those who are around us. And uh, every time I look at Bibb's and I see these things, I see a Samaritan. Because it looks like it's always something that we're trying to give, trying to hold mm -hmm. on to it and be about. And mm -hmm. even the one, the lady um, wrapped up in America. I mean, the woman wrapped up in America, but holding mm -hmm. our markers. It's just mm -hmm. an incredible thing. And it shows that we've lived this through a struggle. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, Mark, can we uh, get some input from you? Absolutely. Um, everybody hear me okay? Yes. Nod your head if you can. Okay. Um, so, you know, this exhibit I think is fantastic. I mean, there are so many things to say about uh, all the pieces. I think we could probably have just a whole session going piece by piece and, and talking about the various ways in which it captures so much meaning and so much beauty at the same time. Um, 
the the piece that I want to talk about uh, is the one that's called the Weight of Freedom. Uh, so if you can, I think if you scroll down a little bit, uh, it's about the the sixth one on the page. Um, you know, while that's the scrolling is happening, I wanted to uh, just thank uh, Willie Ellison, thank the San Bernardino County Museum uh, for putting this together. Thank you, uh, Charles Bibbs, for your artwork, for your career, so for all that you do. Um, it's an honor to be here with with you, Mr. Bibbs, and with all my co-panelists. Uh, thank the audience for being here. And uh, also a shout out to Afala, uh, one of our favorite organizations as well. I was uh, honored to be uh, at one of their conferences about seven years ago. I have mm -hmm. continued to be involved uh, with them. So uh, great organization. Uh, check yeah. them out if you're not familiar. Uh, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Um, so, so this particular uh, image, the way forward, um, you know, for me as someone who teaches African American history, um, of course, all the images I could talk about all the different pieces. But this particular piece speaks to me as someone who studies history, um, because uh, as it as it says in the description, uh, here we have an image of a family that is fleeing slavery, right? Uh, so a group of fugitives. Um, and so, again, we have this imagery of the hands. I think, you know, Jelani, your point was well taken that that's a, a recurring motif. Um, and we have the, the unity. There's so this close-knit community together, this family moving together. Um, and they're pointing the way forward. And, and as the description says, you know, we can think of this as really the, the civil rights movement before there was a civil rights movement or, or the, the beginnings of the struggle, the, the roots of our long time in this country, you know, making this country what it is. Um, so, so much of what we see now with Black Lives Matter, we can trace back to these earlier efforts for freedom and justice, uh, which this image so greatly symbolizes and represents. Um, you know, I, I love the fact that um, also in the image, uh, the, 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 the person who's in the middle, who I, I think of as the mom or the grandma, the, the woman in, in red, uh, yeah. She's looking backwards uh, mm -hmm. as the whole family is moving kind of off to the left. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's symbolic of, you know, as we move forward, we want to continue to think about those uh, who have come before us. Uh, yeah. We think about those who maybe we had to leave behind. Sometimes, you know, because we didn't want to leave them behind, we didn't, we didn't want to move forward, but, you know, we had to or, or we're going to come back and reach back mm -hmm. when we can. Uh, you know, I think about the folks who we may have grown up with, who, who didn't didn't make it out or didn't make it the mm. success that they had the potential to, to have, uh, you know, so many so much meaning for me uh, in this piece, uh, thinking about both historical mm. issues and then issues to today. Um, and so uh, this is the one that that I just wanted to really highlight um, that that stood out for me. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, that one is one of my favorite ones as well. Uh, for a number of reasons, um, yeah. you know, when we first were dragged here, that was the uh, the common goal was the the fight yeah. to be free, the fight for freedom. Yeah. And in 2021, we're still uh, in that fight. Um, it, Willie, can I first, can I make a comment? Yes. Yes. I'm very emotional <clears throat> after after uh, Mark has. Uh, describe this when when you do a piece like this and it's in the and its message is successful to see the public getting it it's a it's a moving experience for an artist um to the point where i cry a lot you know and because i'm so touched by the fact that he got it and he understood it. Um, and I, then I think about a child looking at this and then getting somebody like him to explain in terms that are so relevant that that child, because see, our kids don't, they, they don't teach civil rights in school. They don't teach uh, the history of slavery and schools in fear that they would harm the white uh, uh, 
students. And I read, I read, I, I looked this up and I read this last night. And I say that's why it's more important that we tell our own stories to our kids. It's vitally important. And that's the only way that we can prepare them for a society that's basically they gotta they gotta work for any respect and any opportunities they're gonna get. Okay. And that's the way it is until until things change. When you got you know, they, they demonstrated how, how they felt about this country when they stormed the Capitol. So I, um, and I am more determined. When, I, when, when that happened, oh, uh, you know, Dr. Dr. Robinson, I mean, right on, man. I really appreciate that. And you, you have no idea how I'm feeling right now. But uh, I am overwhelmed and I, and, and that and that's that's it, you know. And that's it. Thanks for for letting me iterate that. Oh no, no, thank you for that. Um, yeah. Can I can I jump in? Uh, yes. I'll make a, one quick other point. You know, uh, Mr. Biz, I, I didn't mean to make you cry, but uh, but I really I'm happy to hear that you know my comments uh, have have you know been a blessing to you. Um, if that's the case, and and I want to also add that you know. As someone who teaches history, I know the power of images like this. Like, like sometimes when I'm in class or, or if I'm, you know, going about my business, um, the, the description that I might give, you know, the, the, what we might read on the paper just doesn't have the same power as seeing mm -hmm. that artwork, right? Sometimes it's the artists, it's the creative folks, it's the, the folks who can bring things to life in interesting and unique and, and, and unusual ways. Or, or ways that push boundaries um, can be so powerful as an educational tool. Uh, and so I just want to again sort of acknowledge you as the as the artist and as the educator you are, Mr. Bibbs, that the kind of things that you're creating is being able to convey this history in ways that uh, are even beyond what you know what other scholars can do. Uh, so, so thank you very much for what you do. Thank you. Okay. Can I jump on the bandwagon? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, no, I just want to say if you would just take the opportunity to see how many things Charles Bibbs does in the community, it's not just his art, it's his communal gift. I mean, if we're looking at the Black History Parade, if we're and he's on our virtual parade, if you look at the NAACP. He's doing the pictures that they're normally giving out. If you look at many of the organizations, especially African American organizations, so he's he's like thread. He's like sewing thread to our community because he weaves our stories together. He makes meaning of our histories, and those things are very important when we work to um strive because civil rights in our history is a struggle. Civil rights is not a celebration. Civil rights is a struggle. struggle. And that civil rights started with, we, we can start with Frederick Douglass. We can start with Africans first getting off ships. We can deal with it, it from the standpoint of Zora Neale Hurston. And she and her story, we can look at it from so many different centuries because as the picture says, the way to freedom, we've always mm -hmm. taken forward that's our struggle is to move forward forward yes yes that's true um and this is just a fraction of uh charles bibbs work if you want to um see more of his work and learn more about charles bibbs please check out his website uh cbibbs.com uh, you could also purchase his work there um, i'm going to ask each panelist a question and then after that we're going to uh open it up to uh, the virtual audience to ask a question. And you could do that um, in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, Charles, to start with you, mm -hmm. uh, how will these most recent social justice protests, police killings, uh, attacks on voting rights, and the capital insurrection, how will that influence your future work? Well, it tells me there's still a lot of work to be done. 
you know, and we're finding out more and more as a lot of these demonstrations occur. Uh, we're finding out uh, and learning more about our opposition. People who, who fear us uh, for whatever reason that uh, we're not worthy of respect and freedom. So for me, that means I gotta, I gotta continue the work. I got to, I mean, as events transpire, I need to be there to make sure that I put it down in a way where our youth can, can grab onto that, where the imagery tells our stories, okay? And where, where somebody like Dr. Robinson can, can look at a piece and analyze it and tell a story. That was, that was profound. And, and that is, that is the, pure essence of why artists do the things they do, okay? Because it, it needs to, they, they're hoping that it makes a connection, okay? And that moment that that connection is made, boy, if artists can get up and do a jig and dance, oh, it's on. Because that's it. That's it, and especially our youth. You know, getting these images in the home, I was inspired by Bill Cosby. Say what you may about Bill Cosby, but he started an evolution of where, where now black people can get images in their homes that look like them. Okay, when you, when you looked at the Cosby show, you saw a middle-class family of professionals, okay, with a house full of kids. But there's one striking difference there. There were images on the wall that looked like them. So, Bill Cosby understood the power of that, what it means to us as a culture. Okay, when you can, when we've done a great job when we sing about ourselves, we've done a good job when we write about ourselves, but the, but the, the, but the image of ourselves does all those things all wrapped in one and it allows the viewer to translate on his own terms and what he gets out of it and translate that message onto others, okay? It's not always my message. Sometimes I'm more thrilled the fact that somebody sees something else that I didn't even think that was there, okay? But that, may, that tells me there's something more powerful working here than just us doing the job that it takes to be free. Okay, because when, because I know when Mahalia Jackson sings that song, there's more going into that song. All the things she experienced goes into that song. All the heartbreaks and all the joys go into that song. The same thing when artists, you know, writes or when artists paints, the same thing goes. You know, I always tell, I was telling when we, we were asked to do this show, they said, we want to show on the civil rights movement. I says, that is not a, a thing that black people love to do because the civil rights movement is struggle. There's a lot of death in the civil rights movement, unnecessarily so, okay? To articulate that in, 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 in ways that it inspires us is not an easy task, okay? But we must do that. That's what we're charged to do. Okay, because our kids depend on it. What are you going to leave behind? How are you going to explain and justify what you did when you were here and responsible for the movement? And how are they going to lift that up? So it, sometimes it takes the artists, the creative people to tell that story. Okay, then it takes, the, it takes everybody else to make it happen. Okay, to stay steadfast. And that's what, that's the story that we're trying to paint. And that's why when, when it's all said and done, the things that we write and the things that we paint and the things will, will stand the test of time. And then that story will always be there to inspire others, hopefully our youth. All right. Thank you very much for that uh, detailed and colorful response. Um, I'd like to thank Wells Fargo. They've been a supporter of the uh, Black History Exhibits for the past two years. So this next question is for Rochelle. 
uh, how will closing the financial wealth gap between the black community and white America play a role in the movement for social justice? And is promoting financial literacy in the black community a priority for Wells Fargo? Well, the short answer to um, will closing the financial wealth gap between black community, um, the black community and white America, um, will it play a role in the movement of social justice? The short answer is yes. But the thing is, is how do we get to the point where, you know, we're doing the things to close the gap? And, you know, one of the things that Wells Fargo, you know, we are doing as a, t as a team member in the conversations that are happening is, you know, we're talking about equity. You know, we, we went from talking about diversity and inclusion, now we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because one of the things is that we have noticed that um, there is a disparity between the income of individuals, you know, even within our own company, but companies, corporate companies across the United States that you have the black community or black team members who are not, who are doing the same work, but they're not receiving the same pay, you know, and so once that is addressed and we are in a place where we have the equal pay, then I believe that, you know, it'll move us towards the, you know, bridging the gap. But the thing is, is that once we do increase our pay, and we have equal pay, what do we do with it? You know, we have to now talk about, you know, what do we, what is, what do our black community, you know, members, you know, part of the black community, how do we go about discussing the additional resources that we have been provided? You know, are we investing our money? Are we, you know, pulling our resources together in the black community to support each other, to build wealth amongst the black community? You know, so it has to start with the conversation first. It's like, how do we get equal pay? And that's one of the things I know within our company, um, we have, we're moving forward towards the equality of equal pay for our team members and, and beginning to see more people of color. And I'm not just speaking just of the black community, but minorities, women, LGBTQ, um, we're talking about Asian American, Hispanics, you know, Hispanic Americans. We're trying to find out what do we do to get ourselves into executive positions that allow us to have the income to build wealth for ourselves and our family and also the community. And so to segue into the next question, you know, what is Wells Fargo doing? You know, do we promote financial literacy in the black community? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. But we promote financial literacy in all communities. That's one of the things that we look forward to doing in terms of like volunteering services. We're always looking for opportunities to be able to present like we call it hands-on banking where we can talk to students, whether it be in you know, elementary, you know, middle school, high school, colleges, you know, about how to utilize your resources, how to save, how to invest. Because in the black community, you know, what I've seen just from experience and being the team member of Wells Fargo for over 20 years is that, you know, a lot of times we don't have these discussions with our children. You know, I know coming from, you know, my parents, my parents were more about, you know, put your head down, get a good job, get your piece of the pie. You know, that was my father's message to us is like, get your piece of the pie, go to school, get an education. You know, but now when I speak to my children, I tell them, yes, get the education. That's important. But then I have to talk to them about financial literacy. Don't just take your resources and just go buy a brand new car. You know, don't just go and just, you know, squander your money figure out where are you going to invest your money to build your wealth? You know, how can I help you to get there? So there's conversations that need to happen mm -hmm. within the black community to determine, to help, to help move our children to the next level of um, how to build wealth. You know, my, my discussion with my children, I tell them, I said, you know what? I know from my parents, they said, get your piece of the pie. My message to my children is like, how do you create your own pie? How do you make your own pie? You know, why do we have to eat someone else's pie? <laughs> Eat your own. Make your own. And what do you have to do to get there? You know? And so, you know, with um with Wells Fargo, like I said, the financial literacy piece is huge within, you know, within our um, our unit and what we do. We're always looking for opportunities. And, you know, it's important that we teach our children and even ourselves um the importance of um financial literacy, not being afraid to go speak to a financial advisor. That's something that, you know, we don't ever want people in the black community a lot of times to know what our um what you know our financial situation looks like because we're probably in debt or we have bankruptcies but the thing is is that no matter where you are in your space of your financial um journey 
always reach out to someone who has the expertise to help you get to where you want to be. You can't figure anything out. You can't figure it out and how to be, become wealthy if you don't understand the process. You know, so go to the experts. And that's one of the things that we have to learn as a Black community is not to be afraid to be transparent, not to be afraid to go and ask the questions and go to the people and to the resources that can actually teach us how to be successful and how to build wealth. Okay, thank you for that response. Uh, Dr. Robinson, your research focuses on the civil rights and the black power movements. Can you draw any correlations between those movements and the Black Lives Matter movement and the fight for, or the fight to protect, to protect voting rights? Absolutely, okay. Um, well, there's a lot there in that question. Um, and, you know, there are many things that come to mind, but I'll try to highlight just a couple of them. Um, you know, in terms of thinking about how Black Lives Matter connects to um, the civil rights movement and the Black Power movement, you know, one, one, one connection, of course, is this continual, uh, what I think we should be a proud tradition of African American uh, ingenuity, uh, persistence, uh, struggle, um, but, you know, finding ways to keep moving forward despite, despite so much hardships, despite so much opposition. Uh, I think very much the Black Lives Matter movement is a part of this longer tradition uh, in the United States, in African American history, and, you know, and, and beyond throughout the African diaspora. Uh, and, you know, it comes, I think back again about that image, uh, the weight of freedom, where you have that family fleeing slavery. Um, there's this long tradition, and Black Lives Matter is part of that tradition. Uh, so that's, and of course, the civil rights movement, Black Lives Matter, also part of that same tradition. There's a book uh, by uh, the great uh, historian Vincent Harding called uh, There is a River, uh, The Black Struggle uh, of Freedom, uh, The Black Struggle for Freedom in America. Uh, and in that book, he uses this metaphor of the river as being this, you know, ongoing, uh, very, um, important struggle of African Americans have been waging. You know, we haven't just sat back and been passive. You know, we haven't just given up or given in. Uh, and there's an important, uh, there's an important way in which we can be inspired by that even to this day. And I think Black Lives Matter uh, reflects that continual inspiration and, and, and struggle and moving forward. Um, another connection that I see, you know, has to do with uh, the response to this ongoing tragedy of the atrocities inflicted on African Americans, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we have to be very open and honest and, and blunt about, you know, pointing to the fact that, you know, our nation has this tragic history where, you know, we have loved it, but it hasn't loved us. You know, we have fought, we have died, we have struggled, we have invested so much, and yet we continue to be, uh, our humanity is denied. Um, and so, of course, in the civil rights movement, you know, the, the murder of Emmett Till, as was mentioned earlier, was this key, you know, moment of transformation where a lot of folks um, it, it sort of galvanized the kind of response where it's not as if that was a unheard of thing. Unfortunately, uh, it was a reflection of a larger pattern that people responded to. So when he was killed in 1955, mm -hmm. uh, you had the Montgomery bus boycott later that same year. Uh, and many other things, you know, kind of happened uh, in the aftermath. I think it, there's a very strong parallel between that and recently with uh, the tragic death of Trayvon Martin uh, in 2012, uh, and of course followed by the death of uh, Michael Brown and, you know, and so many others. And then of course recently, uh, Breonna Taylor and, uh, and George Floyd, and unfortunately the list goes on of so many mm -hmm. names. Um, but if we think about the parallel between, you know, Till and this kind of set of events that followed 1955, and then we have Trayvon Martin in 2012 and the, the set of events that followed, I think there's a strong parallel between um, those, those two events. And, and you know, it's, again, like I said, it's part of this tragic history where, you know, African-American lives have not been valued, uh, have been, in fact, uh, brutally suppressed and, and even, you know, destroyed. Uh, and then we have had to 
claim our humanity, we've had to push back uh, and, and struggle despite despite that. Um, I'll say one other thing. So um, I wanted to to make my last comment. I wanted to point to some of our artwork again. Um, so the, the person who's scrolling, if you could scroll down towards the bottom uh, to this uh, images, one of them is called Come Out Fighting. Uh, so there's two images that have to deal with um, kind of African Americans in the military. So there's that one, and then there's the Come Out Fighting. Uh, there's a, a one about um, African Americans in the Civil War, uh, so soldiers, and then the one below it is African Americans in this uh, tank battalion, right? So there's mm -hmm. um, during World War II, uh, there was this particular um, unit, the 761st Tank Battalion, um, which had this distinguished record. If you haven't heard of it, Google it, right? 761st Tank Battalion. Mm -hmm. uh, great story. Um, but it's emblematic of how African Americans contributed so much uh, to World War II, uh, as well as so many other military campaigns. Right. And so there was, this happens in the 1940s, and then you get black power, civil rights, 1960s, right? So, so what's the connection? There's this connection between um, African-Americans' persistence, our struggles, our investments, our hope, you know, thinking about World War II and the Great Migration as a moment where it was a, maybe we're going to go in a new direction. Maybe the nation is going to finally embrace us. Um, and then there was this, unfortunate disappointment, right, where, you know, soldiers came back from the war and they still couldn't vote and they still were discriminated against and they still couldn't find jobs and so much that could have changed didn't change. I think that disconnect between the potential and what happened um, reminds me of today or more recently where um, I think the election of Barack Obama has a similar kind of uh, story of triumph of persistence of making a way out of no way, of making the impossible come true, of African Americans doing so much for this country, and yet the aftermath does not create the kind of change that uh, we were hoping for, that we expected, that I think even Obama was, was expecting. Um, so uh, if the project could scroll up, uh, there's an image called The Promise, uh, which is, I think, uh, a few images up, um, where you have this um, person, a woman who's sitting, she has, a, I think, a blanket on, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, that's, that's the one. Uh, and, you know, you have Barack Obama's face, and so it's called the promise. That there's so much potential in this moment, um, but then if you actually read the description, uh, the poem that's quoted, it, it's talking about how, you know, this flag really has never represented us, or it's just disappointed us time and time again. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that disappointment between the promise of the potential and what actually happened uh, is partly why the Black Lives Matter movement, you, you know, emerged, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it was the fact that we had a Trayvon Martin, even with Barack Obama in the presidency. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, that's another parallel I see between the potential and the disappointment of this World War II civil rights and the potential disappointment between Barack Obama's election and then, you know, ongoing police brutality, mm -hmm. ongoing, you know, oppression and injustice mm -hmm. in the country. Wow. Thank you for that, uh, Mark. We appreciate it. Um, part of your answer is a perfect segue into the question we had for uh, Jelani. Um, Jelani, in 1991, the Rodney King police beating was caught on video, and we thought that was going to um, change some things. Of course, they were acquitted and then eventually uh, charged federally. Now in the 21st century, uh, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, Michael Brown, Walter Scott, Brianna Taylor, George Floyd, and many others have been killed by police. What kind of laws do you think can be put in place uh, to bring an end to these uh, unnecessary police killings? Well, first and foremost, I think the laws are set up by those in the majority. So one of the reasons why we've always had problems with laws is because the majority are the ones who create the laws. And mm -hmm. the greatest way to see it is 
take it from my Angelo and say, and still we rise. And in spite of all the beatings, in spite of all the abuse, and Zora said, their eyes are watching God. We've always had a response to everything they've done. And since we've been here, W.B. Du Bois stated that since our arrival, no matter what we did, good, bad, or indifferent, it was wrong to those who saw us as different. So if you see, if we complain about our abuse, we're wrong. If we don't complain about our abuse, something's wrong with us. If anything we talk about or do for our movement, we're wrong. So asking your oppressor to validate <laughs> your movement is a kind of sickness. And I was going to say in Sterling Stuckey's book where he talks about African-American art, and, he, and the book is called Going Through the Storm. When we talk about this, he said our biggest problem, one of our biggest problems in America is our need to be dependent, thinking that it's going to change. Mm -hmm. And since those slaves and them whips were beating us, now guns and batons are doing what the whips did. But we're still losing black bodies for mm -hmm. senseless reasons. If it's not the 15 cops in Oklahoma that just been charged with the first degree murder. So when the black kid dropped the gun and he lifted his hand and when he paused to go down, they all shot him. This isn't abnormal. What's abnormal is us getting justice. That's abnormal. The abnormality of all of this is asking your oppressor to do right. It's like if you, if we just take the time to see that since 1800s, how many times have the majority of whites been on the side of African Americans, Chicanos, Asians, and then what was the percentage? Because 60% of white Americans voted for Donald Trump. 60%. So what does that say? That's 2020. We're not talking 1965. Mm -hmm. And then we have to start thinking. So we're asking the very people who don't like us to save us. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing at the barrel of a gun, be it a woman, Breonna Taylor, or be it a George Floyd. Then we're going to go and ask their judge and their jury to sanctify our misery. And what we have from that is a lot of sad stories. Mm -hmm. What we got from that was the civil rights movement. There you go. And that's what we got from. Mm -hmm. We got our misery and the laws that needs to be there is some, <laughs> the policing has to be changed because policing is plantation police. Mm-hmm. We, we have to change that. We have to create police who look at everyone the same. You can't have lynching on January 6th where they use gallows and they scream we're going to lynch people and they don't get charged with a federal lynching law. Mm -hmm. And then you have Black Lives Matter children and one of the founders charged with lynching for pulling one of their friends away from a police. There has to be one America. If you want me to be an American, don't treat me like an African American. It has to be one America. And until we can get that vision clearly, what we'll be dealing with is struggle, civil rights, affirmative action. And it's sad because I thought the Constitution gave us the Bill of Rights. Mm. Powerful, powerful stuff there. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to open up uh, questions and answers to the uh, virtual community as of right now. We just have two questions. The first one is uh, from Andrea. Uh, says, Mr. Bibbs, do you have 
a future peace in mind right now as to what's going on today? Okay, to answer a question, yes, quite a few. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the events that are going right now currently can keep any artist busy for the, for the rest of their lives. There's so much to put down. There's so much to articulate. There's so much to try to get people focused and inspired. I want to take in, for instance, this, uh, this piece I did call The Promise. I know we as a people are not flag-waving people, okay? But I think the, the, the scroll that she, this woman in the chair, which is, uh, and she's draped in the American flag and you got the picture of Obama. Symbolically, that stroll represents Martin Luther King's speech when he said, there will be a day when you a judge on your character and not the, the color of your skin. We came as close to that as possible when Barack Obama was elected president of the United States, okay? It's a little filtered, okay? But we as a people will take it, okay? And see, it's, it's imagery like that that we have to continue to stay focused on, okay? And, and the pieces that I did for the military is to let people know that we, get, we gave our lives for this country and still they'll do everything they can to keep us from voting. We believe in what this country stands for. That, that, is, that is stated over and over again in my art, that belief in the country that we were pulled here out of Africa to serve, okay? And ever since the, the, that piece that we talked about earlier, the way to freedom, is the first civil rights act, is to run as fast as you can from, from slavery. And that's what we did, okay? So those messages are so profound. I mean, you, you just can't, you can't, I mean, as an artist, as any, anybody in the artist, I don't care if you act, I, I see my brothers and sisters really get into this because they understand the profound nature of what they're trying to do, the profound nature of what they're trying to say. It's all about survival. There's nothing more, nothing less. Survival in a country that really gonna make it very difficult for you to make it stand up for the things that they espouse to be. They wrote the Constitution. We didn't. We just want to be treated the same. We want, we want a part of this. We kind of like what that, that's all about. We want to live here. But what we can't understand is why they're doing everything humanly possible to keep us from attaining that. And that's where I'm at as an artist. That's why I listen and I, I, and, I, and, I, and I try to articulate what we're saying and at the same time articulate it what it could mean in the future for us. But it's also a, we're, we're flag waving, okay? Our art, our flag, we're flag waving for us on the count of uh, the plight that we're in in this country, okay? We have to continue to do this, okay? And if, if we don't continue to do this, then shame on us. But it's, it's a necessity and that's why we do it. Thank you for that, Mr. Bibbs. I have a question from Grace Schmidt. Uh, I am an art teacher at Barton Elementary School in San Bernardino. I have introduced my students to your artwork. Would you be interested in joining one of my classes to discuss your art? or create art? Well, I got, some art, I got some art students right here listening to this, right here, physically. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that right, what you just said right there is my, one of my main focus. Okay, this is why I do the art I do, because every piece of art tells a profound story. 
about who we are and where we're going, okay? I can't do anything less than that. I mean, even when I was going to school, when me and my wife Elaine would, would go to these marches and we go to these rallies uh, with the um, Black Panthers, when they came down to Long Beach, okay? We did art for, for that movement, okay? And that's where it really all started, being becoming an activist, an artist who was an activist, artist who, who and, and I, believe me, I've been blessed. I've been blessed tr financially because of the focus that we maintain, okay? And, but we make, we made art accessible, okay? For a long time, artists, I mean, our black people can only go to museums and look at art knowing good and well they couldn't take it home. What we did was put art in every home in America. And we continue to do that. Why, how do we do that? By making it affordable, not doing art for the, the privilege. We're doing art for the average person that has a little disposable income because you don't need art to survive. Okay, but it's art is something that encourages you, it strokes your ego, and it just it it just fires you up, especially if you have it in your homes. Okay, so and that's where it all starts with the youth. Okay, because like I said earlier in the conversation, they don't teach our history in school, and there is a fear behind that. Go ahead, you can check that out for yourself. Okay. It's right there in the computer. Just why don't they teach art in, in schools? Just Google it. They'll tell you flat out that it's something they, don't, they chose not to do, even though that's part of American history. And that little white girls and boys should know that history. That's why they grow up so racially mind, racial minded, okay? Because they don't understand our history. Okay, so as far as bringing the class, I, I jump at the opportunity to the person that, that called in, That's because that's what we do. We have a program, our 2000 Visual Artists Association, nonprofit, and that's all we do is programs like that, trying to en enrichment programs surrounding African American history and artists. That's what we do. So yeah, we'll continue to do that. So. That's all you have to do is ask. We'll we'll arrange it and we'll we'll be there. Great, great. I'm sure she'll appreciate that. She'd also ask, what is the significance of the date on the handcuffs? And that's going back to your um, marching in the spirit uh, image. I believe those are chains, not. But I think I believe those are chains, not hand, not handcuffs, though. Go go back to the image. Uh, I think it's near near the end. It's uh, the first oh, one. one oh, yeah. okay. If you look on the chain, it's got 1865. What's significant about 1865 is when those chains were broken. Okay, so and that's that represents slavery. Okay. So that's what that's that's what that symbolizes. Because until those changes are broken, those changes, that's when our movement started. And then I have some pictures in there about the the we actually went to war and literally thousands of black soldiers died in a war that was fought to keep them in bondage. Then we talked about the tank battalion. Fort Hood called me and said they're, put, they're finally putting up a, a monument for the heroics of those men that fought in Europe and broke records in Europe in terms of their gallantry and their, and their bravery. And they're just now putting up a monument, but they need to pay for it. So they asked me to do an image, which was part of the fundraising. And I'm donating all of those, of those images to them to further their efforts to pay for that monument at Fort Hood. 
That's the home base of the 761st Tank Battalion. See, there's more to it than a lot of people think about our sacrifice for this country. And this is one way, because you're not going to find something like this in a school where they're going to teach our gallantry and our, and our support for this country. Okay, so we have to do it ourselves. And Charles, if I can say, I'm sorry, but if I can say, even in the 1865, the mm -hmm. gun clubs, the, the rifle associations and the gun clubs that we had in Rochester, New York, in Upper State, New York, if you hear the stories of the Southern officers when they talk about the regimentation and the fearlessness of the soldiers. If you know about Charleston, South Carolina, if you know mm -hmm. about Richmond, Virginia, <laughs> and you know about New Orleans, it'll give you a good reason why um, when Lincoln sent that letter to Houston and he told him he had 72 hours, it wasn't because he had 72 hours. It was because of those tens of thousands of African-American troops at the New Orleans, Texas border that was ready to go claim their freedom because it wasn't given to us. We fought at every level for our freedom. And if you see the 1619 Project, one of the arguments is that they're upset that we argue that it was us fighting for our freedom. <laughs> Not that others didn't help, but it was us who fought for our freedom. Right, right. Um, I could jump in. Um, yeah, I was gonna. I'm not sure, is there another question, Lily? Because I was gonna pose a question. No, I, I, I got your comment. I was gonna say, go ahead and jump in now. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I have a question, kind of an artistic uh, question for Mr. Biz. But the person who can control, I think, Ashley, if you could go up to the top of the images again, um, I wanted to ask. Um, so one thing I noticed as I was kind of um, just kind of reflecting on, on the images, and you can kind of see as we go up, um, so with the first, with the, the one at, at the top, that's the emoji picture, um, that one, um, mm -hmm. you notice that the figures are kind of going to the left, mm -hmm. right, are sort of going to one particular, I can think of that either as the west perhaps, or perhaps as the, as the left of the actual image. And if you kind of go down through the pictures, not all of them, uh -huh. but many of them seem to be kind of heading in that same direction. Um, and so, uh, you know, the shoulder to shoulder is not quite, um, but if you go down to the next one, uh, I think you'll see that same uh, yeah. pattern. Too, Here we have this image with delivery yeah. speed. Young woman is going to the off to the Yeah, um, and if you kind of just keep scrolling down, um, you'll see that a lot of the images that people are facing in that one particular direction, <laughs> or they're moving in that direction, uh, or they're looking off in that direction. Wow. Uh, so I guess, I, yeah, I'm just wondering, um, was, was that intentional? Was there, just, is there some symbolism in that, you know, choice uh, for you, Mr. Beard, as an artist? Um, okay, as, that, as an artist. And interestingly, as an art <laughs> go for it. <laughs> okay, it, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful that you brought that up. Uh, artists, uh, creatively, they could be right-handed or left-handed. And the right-handed, just like you, when you when you're trying to throw a ball, it's easier for you to throw it right-handed or left-handed, right? Well, some artists, obviously, I I paint comfortably. People looking to my left versus my right. Okay, so when I'm when I when I'm casually drawing, they're going to be facing to the left. Is that right, to the left? Yeah. Okay. And that's the way it is. But I have to force myself to do it the other way. I have to 
I have to get out of my uh, unconscious mind and and make a effort to do people pointing the opposite direction. I call it the opposite direction. Okay, but that's just a uh, I think it's a hereditary thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. My my critic but by is, is yeah. talking to me. <laughs> but in a sense it, it's it's really the same, but you have to force yourself to do it the other way versus it comes easier the the other way for you. And that's that's the way it is with me. I see. Fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, I'm always curious to hear about the artistic process. And kind yeah. Of how these different decisions are made. This is a very functional decision. Well, you got, of, you got to remember, it's you know, hereditary. <laughs> to to have yeah. the skill to do it, you know, where it comes easy, you know, that is in that is inborn. But to to have to, if I had to learn how to do a lot of things uh, technically. I probably would have been able to do it in both directions with with a lot more ease. Okay, but I didn't I didn't really train myself to do that. I only I only went the easy way. Uh, oh, it's Mark. Working. Yeah. <laughs> Mark. Um I know Mark, a lot of your research also talks about the uh, Pacific Northwest. Do you want to touch on the differences um and similarities? between the uh, struggles regionally from the South to the Pacific Northwest, as well as uh, the Southwest or California in general? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, in, in, in thinking about, so yeah, so I, I'm, I'm born and raised in Seattle. Um, you know, my family, my mom was also born in Seattle. My grandma, you know, came to Seattle from Louisiana. So she grew up in a sharecropping family uh, in northern Louisiana. Um, and, you know, uh, my, um, you know, extended family connections down to the south. So, um, so I have these kind of roots that take me uh, both to the south as well as to, to California. You know, so for, for my family, for many African Americans, um, the journey out west uh, came either was attracted to California. My members of my family settled in California before eventually moving up to the, the, the Seattle area, um, and so it's a very strong connection. So, so on the one hand, I think your question makes me think about how you know within African American history, um, these 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 regions are very interconnected, right? So, so in my research. Partly what I'm trying to show is that, you know, even though Seattle was geographically far away from the struggle, uh, if we think about like Alabama and Mississippi and, and some of the, the heart of, you know, the civil rights movement, uh, it may have been distant geographically, but, you know, in terms of the identity of African Americans, in terms of these family connections, in terms of an understanding that, you know, race continued to be a barrier even in California, even in, in the state of Washington, um, that, that folks at that time, and I think even to this day, they maintain very strong bonds, um, both you know, on an intellectual level or on a heart level, very strong bonds to other black folks all over the country. Right? So, so the, there were certainly regional differences you know, in terms of how, how strong the Klan may have been at a certain area or regional differences about whether the discrimination was put in law or whether it was just more so, you know, put in practice and, you know, kind of un unwritten rules. Um, so, so those are some of those differences, right? So in the South, you know, it was it was in the law, it was clear, it was blunt, out in your face, whereas, you know, places like California or places like, you know, in the state of Washington, it may have been these unwritten rules, but you still weren't allowed to move into that neighborhood or you still weren't allowed to get that job. Right? So, so those are some of those differences. But I think for African Americans, um, there were these really strong connections. And in particular, as I mentioned, if we look at these patterns of migration, um, you know, there are very strong familial connections. Uh, a lot of folks who, you know, were living in the 50s and 60s 
in Oakland, in Los Angeles, in Seattle, they were, you know, one generation removed from the South uh, in many cases. Um, and so their, you know, their, you know, traditions, their, the, the food that they ate, the culture that they, the music that they listened to, you know, was very much connected to this larger uh, experience of the South, right? So, uh, you know, I, I say y'all and ain't, you know, even though you know, I grew up in Seattle, you know, why? Because my grandma, you know, the, you know, she would say y'all and ain't, and uh, I grew up saying it too. So, um, so it's just an example of kind of how these cultural connections really have sustained, um, you know, you know, uh, across vast distances in many sense. Um, I, I think, you know, your your question also when you think about how, you know, uh, specifically last summer and we had the the major large protests in the Pacific Northwest, places like Portland and Seattle, uh, of course. Um, and, you know, there's a an interesting way in which um, in these cities where there isn't a overwhelmingly large black population, um, you know, there has been this uh, organizing effort. Um, I think it speaks to the ways in which um, the, the consciousness that racism is an issue, you know, the, the making that argument um, has been made, you know, and I think you know, that, that's, a, that's a success of the Black Lives Matter movement. I think they deserve a lot of credit, really kind of establishing a consciousness uh, and, and making the point that, yes, we still need to talk about this issue, mm -hmm. even in, you know, 2018, 2019, 2020. Um, but, you know, at the same time, um, there's a lot of kind of ongoing, it's kind of like with the whole Capitol riot, we're still learning a lot about what actually happened. And to some degree, uh, even some activists feel like some of those protests that are happening in Portland or happening in Seattle really didn't necessarily stick to the goals of the Black Lives Matter movement didn't necessarily always, you know, um, remain true to a racial justice frame. Uh, so it gets a little bit complicated. We're still learning more about what happened and kind of how to think about it. Um, and I also wanted to say one last thing. I'm sorry to be talking so much, but uh, you had asked me about voting earlier. Uh, and I just wanted to come back to that. And I, I think um, Jelani mentioned it earlier as well and, and probably – uh, Mr. Vibbs, um, you know, the issue of voting rights is something that definitely should be, you know, top of mind. Um, you know, currently, if you look at what's happening in state governments, Georgia probably being the most obvious, but not just Georgia, not just in the South. Uh, we have state legislatures who are proposing and trying to pass laws, you know, happening right now, happening right this month, uh, that are intended to make it harder for black folks and other people who don't agree with them to vote, right? And this is happening through trying to restrict early voting or trying to make it harder to do absentee balloting or trying to restrict the drop boxes or all these kind of proposals um, that are being put forward. Uh, and it's, it's very, very frightening. Um, and we also need, we should be really concerned uh, and, and definitely pay attention to what's happening. Um, you know, hopefully it won't be as bad as all these proposals are being put out there, but, you know, we have to see. Um, and I think on the, on the one hand, you know, we should also think about that um, they're doing this because they feel our power, right? It's the fact that people like Stacey Abrams, it's the fact that we have, you know, uh, so much increasing visibility in the political realm, you know, where we have Vice President Harris and, and even Biden, giving acknowledgement that it was black voters who gave them that boost. I think all those ways in which we are gaining visibility and having success in that political realm uh, explains why we have this backlash or this reaction. So on the one hand, I think you can take some, some encouragement from that. And then you can say, you know, wow, we're really starting to feel, you know, feel the impact of us is being felt. But at the same time, you know, the reaction is they're trying to undermine it. So that should be a concern uh, as well. Great, great. Yeah, in addition to those um, restrictions on voting rights that they're doing right now, they even have one law that they're trying to pass, believe it or not, making it illegal to pass out food and water to folks in line. Oh. Jelani, mm -hmm. comment on that one for me, please. I, I think Jelani's done. Please. Oh, Jelani, here to leave? There he is. <laughs> It, like you said, it, sometimes it becomes just 
the most basic common things. Whatever we want, whatever we do will become wrong. It's not, a, you know, it's just, uh, or I always say it, it's seeing us as the other. It's not taking into consideration all, A-L-L, it's working with O-T-H-E-R, other. And until we become inclusive, it's hard. And, and what was it, 45 different states or 43 different laws that they're trying to construct to mm -hmm. stop us from voting? And I mm -hmm. thought that, all, that was a right that was a privilege of your citizenry. And, it, and, and how can they do it? By giving us a felony when it could have been a misdemeanor. There's mm -hmm. all sorts of different things they do to limit and strip us of our voting. And the construct of if you just didn't move, if you just was quiet, if you were just compliant, well, we were and we got captured. So it isn't necessarily compliant you know, complacency, being compliant, but mm -hmm. it has to do with struggle. And mm -hmm. even in the vote, if it wasn't for women like Abrams, if it wasn't for the sister in San Francisco and various other sisters, because once again, women, just like that Statue of Liberty, they rose to the occasion. They mm -hmm. gave meaning to what it means to be American. And it was a, it's amazing at what we were going through with a person like Donald Trump, mm -hmm. but what we were able to do, because for everybody else, this was something big. And for us, this was Ronald Reagan. This was George Bush. This was Woodrow Wilson, Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, it, it's not a difference. What's different is our solution. And part of those solutions are what our young kids did is not asking because mm -hmm. nobody knew that the Breonna Taylor and the George Floyd was going to lead to statues being destroyed. We don't know our youth move. We didn't know really that those kids were going to start sitting in lunch counters because after they started doing it, then they started organizing. But these young men said, forget it. They just started doing it. And most of our movements start when the youth just do it. Because mm -hmm. us and our complacency, we're dependent on the system making it better. And since 16, 19, we've always seen that it has to. Great response. Uh, we are closing in on our time. Mm -hmm. So before we go, uh, again, I want to thank everybody for participating and those in the virtual audience. Before we go, can we have each panelist leave uh, the discussion with uh, some words of wisdom or a call to action uh, that could uh, help aid in this current uh, ongoing struggle? Can we start with uh, you, Rochelle? Well, let me first say that I, I want to thank everyone for uh, allowing me to be a part of this panel. You know, and we have some heavy hitters on here. So, you know, Delani, um, Dr. Mark, and, and the wonderful Mr. Bibbs. I just want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of this this opportunity, having this opportunity, just to be a part of greatness from the, you know, the Inland Empire. And Willie, thank you for allowing me as well to be a part of this panel and. This, the exhibit is beautiful, and um, I, I'm an owner of some of um, Mr. Bibb's um, artwork that I have on my wall, and it is a discussion piece. And, uh, so just keep up the great work and, and the visions that you have, and, and I look forward to seeing the creations that you have that will speak for this current generation. Um, I would like to leave it with this uh, for the youth, as Jadon is speaking of, the, the youth of this generation it's going to take them to stand up and become the voice of this current civil rights movement. I mean, we had the civil rights movement of the 1960s, but the thing is, we're still in a movement. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to see who actually stands up to move things forward. Um, 
you know, I, I'm hoping that, you know, for myself, my own accountability is always to, you know, inform, initially to inform my own children, to have um, very transparent discussions about their responsibility in the community to themselves and um, to the family. And when I say community, I'm talking about the black community because they are black children. And, you know, what they are gonna do, you know, and how are they going to voice themselves? You know, one thing my family knows that uh, I may have been mostly silent here in this platform and in this arena, but one thing my family knows, um, even down, cause I'm from Louisiana as well, from Louisiana coming to California, my aunts, uncles, they all know that I'm not afraid to speak up. You know, if something needs to be said, I'm not afraid to say it. And um, because I know that, I know what it's like to be silent. So um, a lot of times I'm not silent. So I wanna leave this with anyone who was on this call to speak to your families, your, your children, your black community, your communities period is not to be silent. It's to have a voice. You know, as my younger daughter told me, you raised me to have a voice. So don't be mad when I eat. So um, I think that don't be afraid to have a voice. Thank you, everyone. Um, Mark, you want to go ahead and go next? Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, let me echo what Rochelle said. Uh, thank you everyone for being here and for my co-panelists. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Um, in terms of kind of action steps or, or kind of uh, kind of final comments, uh, I, I would say that the thing that I would emphasize is that um, don't worry about trying to find the silver bullet, right? I think sometimes, you know, when we look at all these different issues, from policing to the wealth gap to education to healthcare, COVID-19, mm -hmm. right? There's so many mm -hmm. things that deserve our attention and that mm -hmm. are so urgent that, mm -hmm. you know, it's important to kind of keep these things in mind, but it can be a little bit overwhelming and you don't even know where to start and you just kind of don't know what to do. Um, and I think if we, if we kind of tell ourselves that we don't have to find the silver bullet, then maybe that brings some of the pressure down and you realize, as Rochelle said, you know, whatever you do is going to make a positive impact. So whether it be talking to your family, talking to your kids, talking to your siblings, talking to your coworkers, talking to your neighbors, you're doing something uh, and that's going to help, right? Um, so if you look at the civil rights movement, as Delani said, you know, some folks went out and protested. Uh, they didn't ask for permission, you know, and, and many people might have said, no, 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 don't do that. But they did it anyway, and they made an impact, right? So protesters, you can make an impact. Filing a lawsuit can make an impact. Running for office, registering to vote, uh, you know, volunteering in your community, you know, whether it be, you know, helping people find a place to live or find food to eat, right? All these different things that we can contribute, all these different talents that we bring uh, can really help make a difference. And so... Um, we don't necessarily have to worry about finding the one thing, you know, the silver bullet that's going to solve all the problems, because uh, unfortunately, who knows what that might be, and we may never find it. But we can yeah. do a lot of good work mm -hmm. doing the things that we can do yeah. in spaces that we find ourselves. Yeah. Uh, and so I really want to encourage everybody, uh, yeah. and I know many of us are already doing good work. And so mm -hmm. let me acknowledge that and say, see you and, and keep it up. Uh, for those go. who are looking to get involved, you know, Look around, <laughs> you need help around you. Yeah. Lend a hand. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Jelani. Uh... Yeah, first I was gonna say thank you very, very much for being a wonderful host, Willie. And Ashley, thank you very much for having us and putting this together along with um, Charles Bibbs. You guys have to know he's like a friend, a father, a mentor, just, <laughs> you know, that individual and his wife is just amazing. I know she's right there keeping him in line and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, he's our, his, his post in, in my house in Virginia, in my house in California, my yeah. cousins, my friends, my everyone, his art speaks of us. It's, yeah. It gives that fabric of the stain that we carry along with us as a family. 
It gives us hope that there is a future. It gives us understanding that we walk together and that we're clinged to the same chain that brought us here. Yes. Because when you take the chain off your leg, it's so hard to get it off our minds. Mm -hmm. And still working with this chain. And when we can get our weakest link to let go of that and for us to be able to move out of our myafa, which is a great oppression, to our sankofa and go mm -hmm. back to the source. Mm -hmm. Well, I see art, I see poetry, I see dance, I see mm -hmm. music. Yeah. I see those as the envelope that we were not able to mail to Africa. Mm -hmm. We were not able to send our parents, our grandparents, our elders notes mm -hmm. that we broke the chains. But art, it's that envelope. Mm -hmm. Poetry, music, it's the mm -hmm. state which our signature of our African voice because we can't say Angola we can't say Mali, but we can say Africa. Mm -hmm. And it, we send an envelope that we didn't forget you. They didn't take away our voice because we used our voice even in the braids of our hair, the box braids, mm -hmm. even in the sewing of blankets. Mm -hmm. Everything we did, we knew that we were in a foreign land and our hope was a home that consumed us all and the world because it is our birthplace. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity and these lines aren't blurred. They're us. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you very much, Yolani. Charles, go ahead and uh, take us home. Yeah, okay. Well, I want to give all the thanks to the San Bernardino County Museum. Uh, they came through for us again. This is probably the fourth year in a row that we've been associated with them, and they've been so willing, so gracious to, uh, to do things that we needed to do in order to celebrate this month, uh, Af uh, Black History Month. So along with that, uh, the panel, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, we did the job and um, I want to uh, close by saying that I've done a lot of work on the civil rights movement, okay? And in conjunction with a lot of organizations, sororities, fraternities, um, other organizations around, you know, Black Caucus, I mean, you name it, NAACP, working with those people to document our history in a way our youth can grab on it. But I think we have, we have a lot to celebrate. I don't know if you can celebrate civil rights, but we can celebrate our accomplishments. And me as an artist, if you want a little sneak pre preview over the next five or six years, we're gonna be concentrating on those things the things that we have accomplished in music, the things that we've accomplished in, in writing, uh, sports, uh, you name it, all of those things. Because I think we need to make sure that subconsciously we have that imagery in our subconscious mind to inspire us, okay? The civil rights, that yeah, they, they serve a purpose that reminds us. But I think that our victories our accomplishment tells us, yes, we can, and allows us to continue on. So we're gonna be concentrating on that and, uh, in, the, in the next few years. And, uh, and this is probably gonna be permeated across the United States. We've done a good job of communicating. So uh, socially, African-American artists, you know, we kind of link together and we stay together. Um, and if, if you look at my associates, they, they start from California all the way to New York, and we're brothers and sisters in this, okay? And uh, for that, I'm grateful. And uh, we will continue to work, and uh, I'll close with that statement. 
Thank you very much, Charles. Again, to view and or purchase uh, Charles's work, go to cbibs.com. Uh, thank you guys, all the panelists, Jelani, Rochelle, Mark, Charles, and all you all in attendance.